Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, and welcome to another episode of Gnarly Data Waves here presented by Dremio. Okay, and as usual, I am your host, Alex Merced, developer advocate here at Dremio. And not only am I your host this week, I am also your presenter, as this week we'll be talking about migration from Delta Lake to Apache Iceberg. Always a popular topic when you talk about data lake table formats. Why? Because at the end of the day, like this is where the overall trend in the industry is going, in the sense that we all want we all want performance, we all want lower costs, we all want simpler architectures, and this whole idea of a data lake, data lake house can provide those things, and much more so now that we have this whole world of data lake table formats that really enable a lot of things that we couldn't do really do before. So we'll talk more about that, how you can migrate between table formats, data, uh, Delta Lake and Apache Iceberg. Uh, but first, you know, a couple of announcements. As usual, just remember, if you haven't tried it out yet, go try out Dremio test drives. Just head over to dremio.com, click the little test drive button. No cost, no hassle, a few moments, you'll be hands-on with Dremio, seeing the power of how it speeds up performances, gives you this like really easy to use access layer, and all the other benefits that Dremio provides you to running analytics on your data lake to, again, to simplify that architecture and reduce costs. Uh, also, again, in March 1st and March 2nd, it's gonna be our conference, a subsurface, the Data Lake House Conference, where you'll be seeing all sorts of great talks about table formats like we're talking about today, about things like Apache Arrow, about different types of Data Lake House implementations, and all sorts of great stuff. And we're also gonna be doing uh, virtual and in-person this year. So we'll have in-person uh, satellites over there at San Francisco, New York, London, so if you're interested in being there virtually or in person, make sure you go register over there at dremio.com slash subsurface slash live slash 2023. And we're going to be stopping by a city near you with our uh, Dremio Data Hops tour. And again, in this tour, we're going to be coming down. You can come down, grab a drink, or, uh, hang out with your colleagues in the data industry and just have a good time. Okay, so check that out. We're going to have events in Dallas, Santa Monica, Boston, Chicago, London. So head over to dremio.com, check out the event section to go RSVP for an event near you. And Gnarly Data Waves, again, we do this every week, every Tuesday, the same bad time, same bad place. We have also interesting topics. So topics we've done in the past, we did like, uh, you know, working with Superset for your BI dashboard last week. This week, we're doing that whole Delta Lake to Iceberg thing. And then next week, we're doing Tableau dashboards with Dremio and then Apache Iceberg office hours after that. So make sure to keep joining us. And again, if you can't join with us live, make sure you subscribe to the Dremio YouTube channel so you can watch us on YouTube and eventually on every podcast directory that you enjoy. So, um, you know, if you can't come to us, we'll come to you. But with that, now let's begin our regularly scheduled programming. Again, my name is Alex Mercer. I'm a developer advocate here at Dremio. Okay, um, a little bit about me. I have a generally a history of just creating content and technology before, you know, like basically thousands of videos on YouTube about all sorts of web development, data technologies, whatnot. I just really love code, love technology, and just love what's possible. So I talk about it a lot, okay? Um, you know, I also host of other podcasts like the, the Web Dev 101 podcast, the Data Nation podcast, and I've done a lot of development work for many different companies. Um, also have been an instructor training students at boot camps because I like to pass on that knowledge. So that's who I am, but what matters more is why you're here. You're here to learn more about how to migrate from a data lake that's based, or data lake house, that's based on Delta Lake table format, and start migrating some of those Delta Lake tables to the Apache Iceberg format. And that's gonna be the whole purpose of this presentation. It's like, the why would you do this? The how would you do this? and so forth. So again, on today's agenda, we're gonna be talking about like, what is Delta Lake and Apache Iceberg? Cause maybe you don't use either, okay? Maybe you don't, you haven't really fully implemented a data lake house. You're just kind of exploring this whole world and you're just like, why, what are these? Why would I want them? So we're gonna have a chat about that. We're gonna talk about why you might wanna to migrate to Apache Iceberg if you're already using Delta Lake. Um, we're gonna talk about one of the different steps that, that um, go in that journey of that migration, which one of them is gonna be choosing like, hey, what am I using as my Apache Iceberg catalog? Like, where am I tracking my tables? Uh, then the actual migration, like how do we do this? We have two different mechanisms, shadow and in-place migration. So we'll talk about how you do a shadow migration where you are actually making a duplicate of your original data uh, in a different format. And then an in-place migration where we're gonna take, where you, you, if you have parquet-based tables, we can take those existing parquet files and just instead of rewriting them, we can just basically attach them to from the Delta Lake table to an iceberg table. 
And then we're gonna talk about the best practices for your migration plan. Like how would you sort of structure this and think this through to kind of, you know, make this as smooth as possible. So that's our journey. That's our mission if we shall accept it and we shall continue moving forward. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about what is Delta Lake and Apache Iceberg. What are these two leading data lake house table formats and what are their architectures? Because that is going to affect a lot of the pros and cons of any of these. Like each of them have a very different way they get the job done, which makes them stronger in some areas and not as strong in others. Um, at the end of the day, having a data lake house table format of any kind is gonna make your data lake more powerful uh, open up a whole world of tools and types of transactions that you can do safely that you couldn't do before. <clears throat> but they do do these things in different ways. So Apache, so basically, first let me just set the stage for like what came before. Okay, so before you had Apache Iceberg, before you had Delta Lake, you had Apache Hive. And essentially when you wanted to recognize a table on your data lake, so you have your data lake, so imagine you're, you have a file storage system, so either a Hadoop on-prem cluster or you have like AWS S3 file storage and you have a bunch of data stored in files, typically let's say parquet files. So you have all this data and you know, let's say you have all, let's say you're like, you're like Netflix and you have data on every time someone clicked the movie, watched a movie, uh, almost watched a movie, but didn't finish, you know, all this kind of data. Okay. Lots and lots of petabytes of data. Okay. Being generated on a very quick basis. Um, that data is being stored in like parquet files, not just one parquet file, because that's just way too much data for one parquet file. So you might have that one data set stretched across thousands and thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of files. Um, but it's really just one data set. And that's the point of a sort of the, a table format. So basically say, hey, these files, whether they're one file, two files, thousands of files, hundreds of thousands of files, what is my data set? So before you had the hive way of doing it, which basically was that you say, hey, this folder, a particular folder in your file system and all the files inside of it are a table. So when I say, hey, I want to query this data set, it means all the files in this folder. Apache Iceberg sort of breaks away from that. And that's kind of like why it's able to bring a lot to the table as far as what things you couldn't do before. Because instead of saying, hey, this table is just the things in the file, in the folder, um, what it, instead what it does, it says, hey, we're going to have a layer of metadata, a layer of JSON files, Avro files that are going to actually have additional data. So that way an engine like Dremio, like Spark, like Flink can figure out what this table looks like without necessarily having to rely on what files are in the folder. Because it can get kind of slow if you're having to, you know, drop down a list of every file in the folder and then open each file individually and see what's inside that file and kind of figure out what piece together what the table is. It'd be nice if I just had like this one nice little file of metadata that kind of broke it down for me. So you end up with these like three layers of metadata. You have, like if you take a look here in the image, we have the metadata file, which describes the table as a whole. You have the manifest list, which describes one snapshot, so one moment in time of the table's data. And then you have manifest files which basically describe data on a group of files. So there might be groups of, let's say, a thousand files here, a thousand files there. Each manifest file kind of says, okay, hey, this is a chunk of files that are part of this table, and here's some metadata about them. And using all that data, not only can the engine quickly figure out, hey, what is the table, but can also use a lot of that metadata to do things like partition filtering. So it can sit there and say, okay, well, you've partitioned this table based on month, and this data doesn't these files don't cover the months that you're searching for, so we're not gonna scan them, improving your performance. It can do min-max filtering. So for columns that you're not partitioning by explicitly, okay, it can still look at those individual file metadata and say, okay, well, this file only has stuff in this column from this range to this range. That doesn't apply to this query, so let's not scan that. So basically the idea is instead of having to scan every file to figure out what your data is, you can use this metadata to really kind of figure out, hey, what is really the only, the smallest number of files that I really need to scan, um, making much, much more faster queries possible on your data lake. Okay, so that's essentially how like Apache Iceberg does it. So basically the idea is that where the files are physically located do not matter. Long as that they're listed on those manifest files, like there's a saying, hey, this is where the file is, the file could be anywhere, okay? And the beauty of that is it means you can kind of, more creatively allocate your files, which can help deal with like things like throttling on different like object storage providers and whatnot that, that can penalize you for bundling your files too much in the same place.
then you have delta lake okay now delta lake's approach is very similar like if you're familiar with like how git works so like if you ever use git for code basically the idea is like i would write some code and then i would write i would do what's called a commit then i would write some more code then i would do another commit and the actual commit isn't a picture of all the code it's a picture of all the code did the changes from point a to point b so essentially what happens is in delta lake you start off with your first delta file or your first commit okay and then each commit going forward you're capturing not necessarily the changes of the data, you, the changes of files that make up your data. Okay, so it might say, so the first commit may say, hey, these thousand parquet files are part of your table. Then you make some changes, and then on the next commit, it says, okay, well, these files are no longer part of your table. These files are now part of your table. And basically starting from that first commit and going to whatever commit you're querying, uh, the engine can then replicate sort of what your table looks like. Okay, and basically you can bundle those uh based on like checkpoints so you have these checkpoint files that can bundle several commits to make it where you can speed up the process of rebuilding the table because you have like these sort of summary checkpoints um generally the way delta lake tables work they still kind of rely on sort of like that physical hey everything's in the same folder kind of way so it's going to generally look for files in the same folder write files to the same folder um generally tools that read delta lake tables they assume that hey this folder is a delta lake a table so you still do have that kind of reliance on the physical location structure of files um, absent uh, some sort of external catalog um, managed by some some tool that you're using um, but the, the actual like st uh, standard itself basically just relies on sort of hey this is a folder it has the files read these delta well, read these delta these delta log files and these checkpoint files to figure out exactly how do you replicate this table okay um, cool Okay, and then at the end of the day, there's also metadata in those checkpoints and in those delta log files that allows for like further pruning. So it doesn't necessarily again doesn't have to go read every file to start narrowing it down. It can use data in these in this met these metadata in this metadata to to narrow down which files need to be looked at. But again, like the approach is, is sort of different. The idea is you're having this more sequential type um, commit structure versus having sort of like these reusable pieces. Uh, that are kind of more set up like a tree as we saw in iceberg so that's just like the architectural differences but at the end of the day what they're doing is the, is essentially fulfilling that same goal for you because you have a table format like apache iceberg or delta lake you can now say hey those hundred thousand parquet files that's one table and i can write an sql statement to query that table and that's at the end of the day what matters to your end users because they just want to query a table they don't want to think about hey there's these thousand parquet files and i want to scan 20 of them they just want to write a query, and then the engine should be able to figure out, hey, out of this thousand files, you only need those 20. And basically, Apache Iceberg and Delta Lake all create standards to allow that to happen. But maybe you're already using Delta Lake, and you're thinking, hey, everyone's like, you know, getting on this like iceberg bandwagon. What should I do? Like, why, why would I want to do that? Okay, it depends. Okay, you might be doing it for features. Okay, so there are features that Iceberg has that other table formats don't, like partition evolution in particular. So what partition evolution does is that you might you very often will want to partition very large tables meaning basically have it that when you write data to the table that it kind of groups it in sort of a sensical way so if i have data like let's say sales data and i'm typically querying it saying hey i want to look at the sales data for the not last month i probably want to partition it by month okay so that way basically the data for this month is kind of grouped together in a way that makes it easy for the query engine to be like let me ignore the rest of the data let me just go grab that month's data makes it for much faster queries but the thing is that typically with a lot of traditionally with data lakes okay and generally with uh, also with other table formats other than iceberg you create a partition scheme you say hey you partition this table by a month you're stuck with that 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 table will be partitioned by a month for the remainder if you needed to, to do something differently you have to rewrite all the data okay uh with Apache Iceberg, because you're not relying on that physical structure of the files, you don't have to organize the files by partition and do things like that. You basically all partitioning is really just a metadata operation, and you can change the metadata. So it makes it possible to actually change the way the table is partitioned whenever you feel like it, which allows, which means your initial partitioning, it doesn't have to be as consequential as it can be in today's world. There's compatibility mode. Again, this is just a byproduct that, again, you're 
decoupling from that physical layout of files. Like again, you're not you're not reliant on having all the files in the same folder. Um, and this allows you to kind of spread out files. So let's say you're saving data on S3. That's where you're storing your data. Okay, you can get penalized if you have too much data which in what's the same prefix. Simple way to think about it is the same folder. Okay, and it, that could end up hurting the performance because what happens in engine requests, like let's say if there's a thousand files or let's say even a hundred thousand files in the same partition of data. Okay, when you under most stable formats, those hundred thousand files are gonna be in the same folder, the same prefix. And then when you request all those files, you know, in within a second, okay, you're gonna basically send so many requests to S3, the S3 is gonna hold back and say, hey, you can't send me that many requests, which means your engine can't get the files as fast, which means it can't scan them as fast. Now, what Iceberg can do is it can stretch out files within the same partition across multiple prefixes without an issue. So in that case, you're not necessarily sending as many requests to an individual for files in any individual prefix or folder. Uh, so you don't end up having this throttling going on. So you don't end up having, at large scales, you don't end up having those issues. Um, allowing you to kind of read that data. Okay, um, because again, all the partitioning is just a metadata transaction. Then you have hidden partitioning, which makes partitioning much easier to use. Because what would happen in the past is I would create a table partitioned by month. And in order to do that, I'd actually have to take like a timestamp, convert it into a month, into a separate column, and then partition by that new column. And then all my users would have to know in order to take advantage of the partitioning that they would have to query the new column. So that means they would actually have to like understand the way the table was engineered before they could really query it effectively. That just puts like a, a barrier to entry to using the table uh, efficiently and also leaves room for a lot of accidents and people accidentally scanning the full table, which means longer queries, which means more compute costs, okay, slower time to insight, all these kind of things. Hidden partitioning just makes it that you say, hey, based on this timestamp column, we're partitioning it by month. User never needs to care that this is how it's set up because it's against all the metadata. All the user does is they query the table, and if you say, hey, I'm looking for information within these two timestamps, it's going to take advantage of that partitioning. You don't have to worry about, hey, is there some other column I need to query or filter by or anything like this. It just works. So the idea is it just makes it less likely that someone's going to make a mistake and run slower queries when they could have ran faster ones. Okay, so, so features are one reason you might want to switch from a uh, Delta Lake Diceberg. Tooling is another reason. Okay, when you think about like read-write support, Iceberg has really been embraced by the industry over the last uh, year or so. Um, so basically, when you take a look at all the major tools for like querying your data, for ingesting data, etc., all of them have really been really plugging away at adding Iceberg support. So basically, you know, if your data is an Iceberg, you have a bevy of choices when it comes to how do you ingest your data, how you query your data, um, which again, one, gives you flexibility. So that way, you know, basically, if you're Favorite tools not all around anymore. You have other tools you can use. Or if your favorite tool decides to start charging too much, well, there's other tools you can use. But also make sure that hey, when new tools come out that really offer you uh, high-value features, you're not stuck. Okay, you don't have that locking as you would with other formats that either um, either don't have as are, are, don't have as much of, a, of an open ecosystem, or two just don't have that such level of support among different tools. Okay, so you have like again, read, write, support across tools. Also data as code, right? Now there's something called Project Nessie that offers you a very unique thing that right now really only uniquely offers Apache Iceberg and that is the whole data as code paradigm. Okay, and what it does really uniquely is that it offers that paradigm at the catalog level, not at the file level, at the catalog level. Uh, which means that when you're tracking, when I say data as code, I mean adding sort of like a Git-like experience to working with your data in the sense that I can, like Git, not only do I track different commits and different updates to my data, which generally the table format kind of does that, but you add this extra level of branching. So being able to say, hey, you know what? Instead of just having this one linear line of changes, I'm gonna have maybe a couple changes that go in different directions, like a tree of changes. Because maybe I wanna isolate my ingestion. So I wanna say, hey, let me isolate the data, my ingesting of streaming data on a branch, and then merge it in once I know those changes are done. Or maybe I need to make changes to multiple tables. Let me do that on a branch and then merge it in. So it's one big multi-table transaction. Okay, Project Nessie enables this kind of level, uh, at this level, this kind of semantics at the catalog level, which means you're not tracking changes to every individual file. You're tracking 
changes in the metadata, which is going to be a much more lightweight operation, which means for higher throughputs, you can scale higher. But also, because it's built into the way the catalog works, it, it allows you to use SQL semantics. So you can actually use SQL to express branching and merging, whether you're doing it in, in uh, Spark and Flink or in uh, Dremio, et cetera. So these are things that, again, are unique sort of to Iceberg. Openness. OK, you have transparent project management. Um, and again, there's a lot to be said for a good open project because then you just know that there's no one, there's no one particular company who's in control of the project. Uh, the project doesn't live or die because of the existence of one company. Um, and when you're, you know, when you're trying to decide, hey, you're going to commit something to long term and put a lot of money and time and effort into building your data stack on something, you want to make sure that, hey, they're, they're, you have the kind of support that you don't necessarily have to you're not going to get, have to unexpectedly rebuild your data stack one day. Okay. So Iceberg has a very open and very robust ecosystem and, and, and circle of developers that work on it and which with, with transparency. So basically you can, anyone can join sort of like these open, like uh, Iceberg meetings. You can see the Iceberg mailing list and see them discuss uh, updates to the format. Like everything is very, very visible. You have very wide variety of companies who are uh, adopting Apache Iceberg. Netflix, Apple, Dremio, Morse. There's just a, a huge number of companies who are contributing and using Iceberg in production. And you have a pretty active Slack channel, okay? Like, I'm generally in, like, all the Slack channels for all the different formats. And, you know, I'm seeing posts coming in every day and questions being answered every day over there in that Iceberg Slack channel, uh, giving you a good place to kind of get the support you need when you want to learn more, get in, uh, whether you're looking to develop and contribute to Apache Iceberg or you're looking to implement and you're looking for assistance in implementation for Apache Iceberg. So those are all reasons you may want to make that switch, okay? Now, let's say you decide, like they say, hey, these are good reasons and I wanna make that change, okay? And again, it doesn't necessarily mean adopting a table format. There are situations where you might wanna work with multiple table formats, um, depending on what your particular data stack is. So um, creating ice, having an iceberg footprint in your in your um, data lake or data lake house it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have to completely abandon what you're using now but at this point you, you might say hey be, there is some value in these benefits so i either want to incrementally adopt or maybe fully adopt apache iceberg in my data stack but the first step is to figure out what catalog you're going to use because that catalog is going to be what tracks what tables exist which tracks sort of hey what can your end users um query Okay, and there's different there's different ones. Most of them are generally are doing the same operation in the sense that they're tracking one thing. Like the catalog does something really simple. It just tracks the location of the main metadata file. Okay, and essentially every query engine is going to go to that catalog and say, "Hey, I'm looking for this table. Where's the metadata file?" And that that catalog can be like, "Yeah, the meta table, the metadata is over here," and then it goes over there, and then the rest of the query engine its process is really going to be wherever all those files are stored. Okay, so the catalog is really something that like it's going to be hit up real quick, but it plays a huge role in just giving you those like consistency guarantees. So we've already talked a little bit about Project Nessie's catalog. So this is a out of all the catalogs, this is like the only one that was really built specifically to be an iceberg catalog. Like you can use Hive, but Hive was never originally built to be an iceberg catalog. You can use AWS Glue, but that wasn't initially built to be an AWS catalog. You can use a lots of other things like databases and whatnot. You can use those, but they were never built for that purpose. Project Nessie, because it was built with Iceberg in mind, it gives you that sort of Git-like functionality. Or really, let me put it this way, Project Nessie was built with data lake table formats in mind, okay, to, have to kind of serve that, that category. And because of that, it brings you that Git-like functionality I, talk, I talked about earlier. Um, and now it's easier to adopt because you have a cloud-managed service in Dremio's Arctic uh, platform, which basically says, hey, you don't need to go spin up a separate server running Nessie. For free, at the click of a button, you can have a Nessie catalog that you can use to do, and you don't even have to use um, any particular engine to do work to that catalog. So if you want to go you know, ingest data using like Spark streaming or, or with Flink, you can do that into your Nessie catalog. If you want to go then query that data with like Dremio, Presto, Soon, Trino, Trino has a pull request, so that way you can support Project Nessie, you can do that. Like, that's the thing. Like, Project Nessie is open. Okay. And again, the theme here is that value of open, but it's going to give you that extra sort of data as code functionality. It's going to give you a whole bunch of features. And then when you're using Dremio Arctic, you get the, the nice 
UI. You don't have to manage it because it's a service. And you're also going to get a whole bunch of other really cool features that are coming down the road. So it really does offer you a lot. Um, but everything has a pro, has a con. Okay, so again, the number of engines that support Project Nest is a catalog. Because again, it's not just whether a particular tool supports Apache Iceberg. Every, you know, they have to build support for each of the different catalogs that Apache Iceberg supports. Um, basically, uh, Project Nessie is still growing its support. So again, right now you have like support for like Spark, Dremio, Flink, Presto, uh, very soon Trino, once that pull request is merged in. So it is growing, um, but generally most tools will, will, will work. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about the REST catalog, how that can uh, offer you some other possibilities. Okay, if not using uh, Arctic, you, again, if you're not using Arctic, so if you don't use Dremio Arctic, then you would have to deploy your own Project Nessie server. So there's a Docker image. It's pretty easy to just spin up the Docker image and have it running. It's a pretty lightweight thing. Um, but again, that'd be, a, that'd be a piece of your infrastructure you'd have to manage. Um, but again, it's just easy as enough to have Dremio manage it for you, OK? And just having the catalog is no cost. OK, Hive Metastore, OK? You, if you have a Hive Metastore that's part of your particular data stack currently, well, instead of having to add a new piece of infrastructure, you could just use that Hive Metastore to track your tables. OK, so that's great. Again, if you have a Hive Metastore, then that's a great choice because you don't have to set up anything new. You just use what you have. But if you don't have a Hive Metastore, well, then you have to deploy it. So there, there's a, that, that's the downside there. In that case, if, if you have to deploy something, then you might want to just explore something like Project Nessie. OK, then you have AWS Glue. AWS Glue is great if you use a lot of uh, AWS services. So if you're using like, AWS Athena, Redshift, uh, you're using um, the AWS Glue for ingestion, then using the AWS Glue catalog is going to be a natural fit because it's just going to have a really good interoperability with all the services. And again, you can still then, and again, any of these catalogs, you can hook up to uh, an engine like Dremio and be able to query those tables. Okay, you're not, you're not stuck with just, hey, like, hey, if I want this one catalog, I can't use any tools. Generally, most of the tools are going to support these. Um, but again, you know, once you get, if you're not heavily invested in the AWS ecosystem, then again, you're at the mercy of like, hey, do other tools support reading the AWS Glue catalog? Generally, that's a pretty, pretty well supported one, even outside of uh, the AWS environment. So it's actually one of the catalogs that you can currently work with when you're using the Pi Iceberg Python library. Like right now, if you're using Pi Iceberg, it's AWS Hive and the REST catalog are the ones that are currently working. They're adding more. Pi Iceberg uh, functionality for more catalogs as we go. There are other catalogs such as HDFS. HDFS just means file system catalog. It means sense for like a Hadoop file system, but it's really just any file system. Um, this is great for like you know a POC. This is great for if you have a single writer. Okay, the minute you have more than one writer writing to these tables, you really do want to have some sort of other catalog uh, to protect your consistency. Um, so there's that. There's JDBC. You can use basically any JDBC compatible database as a place to store your your catalog. Uh, generally, though, I haven't seen that too many engines support connecting to a JDBC catalog. So um, that would sort of be a big con there. Newest thing, what, what really the newest catalog, which isn't really like a new catalog, it's more of a new spec. It's called the REST catalog. So what the REST catalog is, is essentially a API spec. So you could create your own catalog, essentially. You can create your own, you know, whatever language you want, you can create a catalog that does things sort of like the way your, that meets your specific needs. Um, and then you would implement that API. And long as you meet the open API spec, basically any tool that supports the REST catalog can communicate with it. So basically the REST catalog just opens up the world for there to be many more catalogs without every time a new catalog being created, there having to be sort of a whole new set of connectors being created. Um, so I don't think there's any sort of big implementations of it yet, but the idea is that the spec exists. You could create your own implementation. I've been working on creating a little mock implementation um, just, just to see if I can. Um, which again, it's actually pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but a cool thing, a cool application it could be is like, let's say you have um, multiple catalogs. So let's say, you know, you were using a tool, you want to have Project Nessie, and, but you also have situations where you need a Hive to do that. You could theoretically create like a, a REST catalog implementation that behind the scenes syncs these two other catalogs that you use for other tools. Um, 
but then you know everyone connects via like the rest interface because it acts as like an interface between you using these other things so the point is like you get the it's like a make your own catalog type situation as long as you have the right endpoints um set up and returning the right things it all works and the cool thing is you're not married to any catalog just because let's say you choose whatever catalog it makes the most sense right now but another one like let's say you start with hive because that was the easiest way to go because you have a hive meta store but later on you want to use project nessie there is the register table method that's built into the catalog class that you can use to register a table within your catalog so later on i want to switch over to project nessie i can just hop into like right now i would do this through like the java api i would create a new you know create a instance of my project nessie catalog register the meta the, the meta store uh, the metadata file with that catalog tada now that table's now part of that catalog so there is that option Okay, but again, there's like two approaches to like migration. There's in-place migration, which means we're gonna keep the data where it is. We don't, we do not want to rewrite the data. Uh, this is gonna be sort of like a low-cost way of doing this because you're not rewriting as much data, so there's a lot less compute involved. Um, you know, there's pros and cons because again, if you don't rewrite the data, then you can't do any kind of optimization. If you want to like cluster data, sort data, um, you want to repartition the data, things like that. You're not gonna be able to do that because you're using the data files as they are. Okay. Then you have a shadow migration. Okay, and a shadow migration, um, what's happening is you are going to basically make a copy of the data. You are rewriting the data, but you're gonna have that opportunity to like sort, to repartition, to optimize that data in its new landing place. And then what you do is you kind of sync it with the original table and then you kind of ease off of it. You're gonna kind of, you know, phase from the original version to the new version. So first let's talk about sort of the mechanics of how, like what are the tools that you have built into Iceberg to help you do these things. First we have to talk about the in-place migration. In an in-place migration, what happens again, you're taking the existing Parquet files and you're saying, um, I want them to be part of this table, okay? And again, this could be a Hive table, this could be a Delta Lake table. Um, so you have, let's say a Delta Lake table, okay? And that Delta Lake table, has a bunch of parquet files that are part of it. Okay. What you do is you can use um, this migrate. Well, this migrate command, well, I'm going to come back to that because right now there is a pull request that might add functionality to that to support Delta Lake tables. So right now, the migrate functionality that's specifically for Hive tables allows you to take a Hive table and turn it into an iceberg table. Um, but there's also the add files procedure. And the add files procedure allows you to take any parquet file, including the ones that are in your Delta Lake table, and add them to an iceberg table. Okay. And basically, the way that works is you would just say, hey, I want to take all the parquet files that are in this table path, like this folder right here, and I want to add them to this table in my iceberg catalog. So the steps would be you first create the empty table with the correct schema in your iceberg catalog, and then you would run this add files procedure. Um, but a couple of things you would want to keep in mind, though, is that in your Delta Lake folder, in that folder of, Delta fi of files for that Delta Lake table, you might have tables from multiple snapshots. So you don't want to just add that whole folder. You're going to want to make sure that it only has the files for the newest snapshot. So the way you would do that is you would expire all the old snapshots. So you would just vacuum everything, okay, using that sort of vacuum procedure in Delta Lake. Expire everything before the latest snapshot, then vacuum it. So that way, the only files that are left are those of the latest snapshot so that way when you do this add files they say that table will be that you basically your file will represent uh, the latest snapshot okay and then you didn't have to rewrite any files so that is an approach uh, again as i kind of alluded to earlier there is a pull request there is like a module being built that should um, enable sort of like this kind of process for more like the migrate process of just being able to say hey this delta lake table turn it into an iceberg table so that functionality is is coming down the pipeline. So keep an eye out for that. Okay. But again, right now, the way you can do that is you just basically say, hey, these parquet files, add them to this iceberg table. You're not rewriting any data. It just works. Okay. The other option you have is to do a shadow migration. And basically, it just means rewrite the data. Okay. And you do that through like a create table as in a CTAS. Okay, so you're just saying, hey, I'm going to run this query. And again, that query that you run on the original table can then, you know, do a sort. And then in your create table clauses, you can add partitioning. So I can say, hey, the new table is going to be partitioned this way. And then I want you to take 
take this query and this old data and sort it this way. And then you come out the other end with like a much more sort of like optimized table. But again, this, the statement would look like this. I would say like create table. This is, this is assuming like you're using Spark. Um, it can be done in Dremio, but in Dremio, you don't need the using iceberg clause. Okay, that's generally a, particularly for Spark. But I could say, hey, I want to create a new table. And then, you know, I would just give the table a name. I would say, part, I could say, oh, hey, here are the partitioning details for that new table. And then I would then do a select, do my query. And then in that query, I can then, you know, do a sort on the data and whatnot. So that way it's adding the data already sorted. And then it's being partitioned. And then I walk out the other side again, not only having my, my data in Iceberg, but also again, very optimized in Iceberg on the other end. So if you're going to do that rewrite, you might as well take advantage and do that rewrite performantly. So again, you have those two choices. So again, you have in place, take parquet files that already exist, add them to an existing Iceberg cable, rewrite no data, but again, no optimization at that point. You're just doing it as is. Or two, you do the shadow migration where we're going to rewrite the data. Great if you want to like, you know, re-optimize the data, clean up the data, change some of the columns, you know, just do some of that kind of stuff. You know, we can do that in our select query so that way the query, the data that gets added in, you know, it basically matches what we want going forward. Okay. So now basically which approach to use, okay, you might want to use the migrate procedure again. Um, and again, that's going to be more specifically for when you're working with, uh, right now it works particularly with Hive tables. Um, again, there's a pull request that might add functionality for that to, to start working with Delta Lake tables. Um, but again, the idea there is you're moving an existing Hive table to a new iceberg table. If you're taking parquet files from any kind of table, so I mean, even theoretically like a hoodie table or a Delta Lake table or a Hive table or whatever, you just have these parquet files that exists, so you just you can use that add files procedure. So that works regardless of what the format is. That's the beauty of it. It's just saying, hey, these parquet files are now part of this table. Okay, but again, you can't really be updating the schema and all that stuff. You're sticking to what those files, those already existing files already have. That that's your constraint. Then you can always use a CTAS to move anything, anything really, um, because again, you could always CTAS to Iceberg from any source, because it's basically any source that can connect to Spark, any source that can connect to Dremio. Um, you can then run a CTAS statement into Iceberg. So theoretically, not only can you use a CTAS to take Delta Lake tables and turn them into Iceberg tables, but they could be Postgres tables. They could be Hive tables. They could be uh, literally any uh, source. Uh, you just say, hey, I'm going to query that source, and I'm going to create a new table from that query. Okay. Um, and then again, the register table method will allow you to, it's now about migrating from one format to another, but migrating from one catalog to another. So you have that option there. Okay, so that way, in case later on you decide, hey, you know what, I've, I've been happy with Hive, I've been happy with AWS Glue, but I'd like to try out Project Nessie, let's try it out. Okay, that that would sort of be the one you could do that, so that way you don't have to rewrite the table. You would just say this table is now, now in this catalog. Now, some best practices. Generally, if you're doing a migration, you want to do it in steps because you want to make sure that you you know you do quality checks and make sure that everything is kind of in sync. Okay. Um, so generally phase one, you're going to read the original table and you're going to write to the original table. Okay. So basically as queries come in, everything's working with the original table, assuming it's like a shadow migration. Then in the second phase, what's going to happen is that all the reads, everyone's still doing their analytics off the original table. Whenever you write, you're writing to both tables. Okay. So you're going to update both tables so that way you keep them in sync. So the idea is like you want to kind of edge off the old table. Then in the third phase of the process, okay, now people start reading from the new table. So now people don't even realize that you flipped the switch and now basically you are, all your queries are feeding off that new table, but you're still writing to both tables. Again, you want to have that old table just in case something, you know, isn't set up right or something breaks, you still have that fallback. Okay. And then once the, once the, once they're all in sync in phase four, then everything just kind of moves off to the new table and you're not working with the old table at all anymore. And you can get rid of it, save yourself that storage, and you move forward with your nice new iceberg table. And I think that is the end of the presentation. So what I'm going to do is we're going to open it up to questions now and um, we'll go from there. So hopefully you guys had fun. And again, if you have questions, uh, we'll answer those now. Okay, so time for some Q&A, hey, everybody. Okay, that was a good time. Now, the first question we have coming in is, and again, you can put your questions in the Q&A box. So any questions you have coming in, put them in there and I'll keep an eye on them. 
First question is, do the different ways of migration affect the query performance after the migration is done? Uh, inherently, it shouldn't. Um, like the only, it, like for example, only depends on like what the data is and sort of like how does the data lend itself to be querying, to be queried efficiently. So for example, if I'm doing that add files procedure, if the data is, you know, um, not well clustered, uh, the partitioning is kind of not meeting what my needs are, then I'm going to still have those issues because again, the way the data is structured and organized hasn't changed. Um, but, um, but again, that has more to do with the structure of the data in the files and the way the data, the files were originally written more so than the method of migration. So if, if you have perfectly clustered data go, and then you add those parquet files to an iceberg table, then that's going to work out great. Um, so it really is going to depend on specific use case and the specific data and the way it, it is written. Uh, and also it's going to depend on the particular tool that you use it. So there might be minor differences depending on whether you do like a CTAS with Dremio or CTAS with Spark or CTAS with another pool, uh, as each of them might do the writing slightly differently. So it will you'll get you'll get uh, different variations on the same story. Okay. Next question I have is how do I identify which parquet files below to uh, belong to the current Delta Lake snapshot? Um, the best way to do that is honestly to expire all the old snapshots. So you expire all the old snapshots, then vacuum it. So then you know for sure, without a doubt, the only parquet files that should be left are ones that belong to the current state of the table because all previous states are no longer valid. And then in that vacuum operation, it'll clean up all the parquet files for any invalid uh, that are no longer associated with the valid snapshot. Um, so that would be the way you would make sure that uh, you have the right parquet files. And again, it doesn't matter where the parquet files are from. So again, that same logic that we just applied to Delta Lake could apply to a hoodie table, could apply to anything that is parquet based. Um, cool, cool. Next question. How can I optimize my table while doing the migration? So going back to that whole CTAS thing. So you can't do that with add files because the idea is again, you're using those files as they are. But what you can do is again, in that select query, so on the, the select leg of the CTAS query of the create table as, you can do things like sort the data. Um, also in that create table as, you can specify the partitioning. So you can take that opportunity there to, to make those changes. Um, but essentially it would be either the way you partition the data in the partition by clause, or the way you query the data in your select clause, which you can use the opportunity to like sort it and change field names, things like that. How does Iceberg maintain performance if user needs uh, user needs not to know partition column ahead of building the query? The reason being is that the way Iceberg works is that it doesn't it there basically what it does is tracks the relationship of the partitioning column. So in a sense of like what you see in the metadata is you don't see hey there's an hour column and a month column. What you do is you see that hey the way we're going to track the partitioning data for this particular column of the timestamp column. So let's say we have like, you know, timestamp of sales. Um, it, we would say, hey, there's a partition transform. So there's all these transforms for uh, month, day, uh, hour. Um, there's also bucket and uh, truncate. Um, it tracks what transforms need to be applied on the data in that column. Okay, and then it tracks those partition stats in the metadata. So basically it'll know it's like, okay, hey, this file covers data between these per these transformed values. So basically, even though the actual parquet file only has the timestamp of the month, uh, the has the timestamp of the sale, not divided up by month, not divided up by day, just the timestamp, the metadata actually tracks those partition values and knows, okay, this man this manifest covers this, these, this range of partition values. So in that case, the query engine, knowing that you query the timestamp column, because you still have to query the time, the fundamental columns, you don't have to you don't have to query additional columns because in the past with like Hive, you'd query the timestamp column and you'd have to query these additional like month and day columns to get the partitioning benefit. So in this case, if I'm just asking for, hey, this timestamp between this timestamp, when, as the engine goes through the metadata, it's gonna be like, oh, okay, this table is partitioned based on a month transform on this column. That column was part of the filter. Okay, now I'm gonna go through each manifest it's gonna see the range of values that that manifest covers and says, okay, I don't need to look at this one. I don't need to look at this one. So that filtering process occurs in the metadata, not in the individual files. So those files, the parquet files themselves don't need to have this additional month column or day column, nor does there need to be a filter on some sort of extra column. 
Um, that's a little bit different than the way that actually like Delta Lake does it because they have a similar feature called generated columns. And in the generated column feature in, in Delta Lake, um, they take a different approach. So there you are writing additional data. So what do you do is you create like a function and you're saying, hey, this column is a function of this other column. So it'll basically, whenever you write to that column, it's just automatically gonna generate that additional column in your data. So you are writing additional data to the parquet files. But what they do on the other side is that they'll automatically generate the extra partition, uh, the extra filter query when you're partitioning. So the big difference is, are you writing that additional data um, to your parquet files every time you, you write? Um, but they kind of end up in a similar place. Um, but that's the, why, that's the reason why you, user doesn't need to worry about extra columns because there's no need for extra columns in iceberg um, because it just tracks it's all tracked in the metadata the actual transformed values okay um cool let's see here let me let's see you answer that one live by the way I forgot the second layer of metadata consists of okay yeah the sec so the second layer of metadata consists of so again there's three layers of metadata in iceberg so the way I always like to think about it is like the first layer the metadata.json file that is the table level. So when I'm like, hey, what is the table? Like, how is the table partitioned? How how was the table partitioned in the past? What's the table schema? How was it? How was the schema in the past? That's at that top level. That's where you find all that information. In the second level, that's the snapshot level of metadata. So it says, okay, hey, here's this snapshot. So this is our this current state of the table, and it's made up of these groups of files, these manifests, and each of those groups of files in that layer, it's going to have like hey, this group of files covers partition values between X and Y. This one covers partition values between X, you know, uh, Y and Z. And then based on that, we can say, hey, we don't need to look at this group. We don't need to look at this group. And then the third layer is, is those groups. So then we can take a look at the individual files and say, hey, this file covers, and not just the partition values, it covers the value for each column and say, hey, based on the ranges for each column, we don't need to look at this file. We don't need to look at this file and really narrow that down to the, to the nearest subset of files to scan. Okay, in the case, uh, in the case, would the query need to filter on the month, for example, or the timestamp itself? But the latter is how the partition transform leverage at all. Um, there, yeah. So there, the idea is that there would not be a need for a month column. So there would be no month column, no day column. There would just be a timestamp. So from the user's perspective, they're just querying. They're just saying, "Hey, I want data between this day and that day." So they don't. They're not aware. So there's no need for this additional column. So there's no need for them to do an additional filter on a like say, hey, I want everything between these two timestamps, between this day and that day, between this month and this month, because that's how some of those hive queries would look like. You're so you're like, it's kind of like redundant. If I'm already saying between this timestamp and this timestamp, why should I then again specify day and month? This makes those extra legs of your query unneeded. Long as the user hits that uh, timestamp, and basically when you created the table, it knows that hey, you're tracking relative to this timestamp it by month or day, it's going to do all those relative calculations behind the scenes to narrow down those files. So the user doesn't have to think about the way that the, the data engineer or the person who created the table engineer the table. If the table is partitioned in a way that can optimize the query, it just will. Um, because it's aware of how it's transformed. And if you query, a, a, if you filter by a field that has transforms on it, it'll make best use of those transforms. Okay. Um, uh, who supports Iceberg versus participates in the development? Uh, 3 a.m. something is not working support. Um, not quite sure I understand that last part of the question, but bottom line is, as um, far as a list of who supports Iceberg, far as on reading and writing, so not talking about development, talking about just like, hey, being able to read an Iceberg table, write an Iceberg table, I would refer to the table format uh, comparison article that I wrote last year. I am going to be updating that soon and, and basically going adding more tools to that list and updating the support for all three table formats. Uh, right now I'm in the process of like crunching all the numbers as far as like, hey, you know, uh, a lot of the numbers that were in the article last year and just getting new updated numbers. So keep an eye out for that. Probably in the next month, I should have that complete. But I would refer to that article that has a pretty good list of all the different like engines. Um, I'm gonna see if I can maybe add like a list of ingestion tools uh, in, in this next update as well. So that way you can kind of see, hey, which ingestion tools have like native iceberg support or native footy support or de native Delta Lake support and all that kind of stuff. But um, I would say, I would again refer to that, refer to that, but I, uh, for the most part, I would say it was, it's easier to think of which engines don't support I iceberg than to try to remember all the ones that do, because most of them do. I would say there's, it's, and then the thing is that it's not just read support. That's the key thing. It's the, key, the thing is that the, the additional write support. There's a lot of tools that can write to iceberg. Um, you know, that has changed a bit over the last year. Because some of the some of the issues that made it difficult to write to Delta Lake 
have changed in like uh, Delta Lake 2.0. So there, I would say, so probably there is some changes in sort of like the the level of support there was compared to this time last year. Um, but still, I would say Iceberg probably has the most sort of width, the broadest width of ways to kind of write ingest uh, and broadband, just broad full throat support. Um, okay, going back to the next question. So creator needs not to specify which column to use for filtering. You would not have to, you do not have to filter based on additional columns. So the idea is that there's no need for additional columns beyond just the original data. So in this case, all they would need to do is say, hey, I want to query, I want to filter the timestamp. I want to filter by the timestamp between this range. And as long as the instructions were given in the definition of the iceberg table, that that table should be partitioned by month or day on that timestamp field, it's going to take advantage of that partitioning. Unlike the old days where you would have to make additional columns. So basically there would be three uh, uh, predicates in your, in your query. So you, you would not only say, hey, give me this range and this range of timestamp, but you'd also say, give me this range and this range of day and this range and this range of month, which again, is kind of redundant. And if you don't know that you need to put in those additional filters, you'd end up scanning the whole table. So the idea is that every, a user is generally going to intuitively know I need to, I want to query the timestamp field because that seems like the most logical thing to filter. They wouldn't necessarily think that there's an additional month field. And that was the problem in the past. So you would have to actually have to read documentation and be aware of that field. And if you didn't filter by it, but you did filter the timestamp column, you ended up scanning the whole table. And it was just a much longer query. You just don't have to worry about that. You just say, hey, this is the data I want. I want the data between this timestamp and this timestamp. And long as in the definition of the table, the partitioning, the right partitioning markers are there and the, and the data was written that way. So it's all in the metadata. You're going to get those optimizations. Okay, uh, next, if initial file format change with additional columns, do we need to work with the metadata or it will auto adjust itself? If initial file format change, additional columns, do we need to work with the metadata or it will auto adjust itself? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, so I'm gonna approach it from a couple of different angles. Um, again, you do have like full schema evolution support in Iceberg. So essentially if you add additional columns, that'll also just work. It, it'll, be, it'll basically keeps an array of current and previous schemas and we'll be able to match up and say, okay, basically construct the data with the current schema. Now, if you load part, if you're using like the add files procedure and you're adding the files to an existing iceberg table, the schemas do need to initially match. So basically if I say, if I run add files and say, hey, add these thousand parquet files that were part of a Delta Lake table to this iceberg table, they initially need to match. But then going forward, if I do, um, if I take advantage of iceberg schema evolution, uh, I can then change the schema after the fact. It's just that initial metadata has to kind of match the files um, in, in that initial sort of add um, so that we can read, the, read do that in those initial, that initial metadata writing fine. Um, and then after that, you know, it's just an iceberg table and you can change the schema as, as you will. You can do what you want afterwards. Uh, basically, it's just about that initial change if you're using the add files procedure. If you're using a CTAS, then you can do whatever you want because essentially you're creating the iceberg table at that point. So the schema will match whatever you're creating the table from. So, you know, if I say, you know, create table as, select, whatever, whatever, whatever that data set is that I'm creating table as, that's what the schema of the iceberg table is going to be. It's just going to match that from the get-go. So I don't have to worry about that. Uh, oh, okay. Got it. Okay. So here we go back to this story. Like, who do I call at 3 a.m. when it's not working? Where can I buy subscription support? Okay. So... Now for this question, again, it, it depends on what tools you're using. I would say like um, here at Dremio, we have pretty um, broad-based support when it comes to Apache Iceberg. So particularly, especially if like, you know, um, you know, we would be a good place to get, you know, help with your, with, with your Iceberg um, uh, if you have Dremio support. Um, so that'd be one place. There are other tools that support Iceberg. So again, there's particular support, you would talk to them. But again, if, if, if you are working with Dremio, and Dremio is part of your data stack, um, we would definitely be, um, and you have a Dremio, like Dremio supporting you, then yes, we would, we would you call us at 3 a.m. Um, and we would help out, um, you know. So we would, I would be, we would be in that camp of people who, are, you know, we, we're here, to, we're here to help you. Um, but um, also, but far as just like general like support that's out there, um there's also the uh, the iceberg slack channel which is pretty active like I'm, I'm i mean i'm on there all day like so for example you could if you join the iceberg slack channel you can message me there and ask me more questions if you'd like um 
but that would be another place where you go support. And all the developers in Iceberg are pretty active and pretty, pretty, um, they really go out of their way to, to be helpful to everybody who posts there. Um, it's very, very awesome to see. Um, so I would definitely say that's also a really great resource. And I mean, you know, they, 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 they're the ones who wrote the code. So they, 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 they know that stuff in depth and they can give you really, really in-depth answers to, to a lot of things. Um, okay. Next. Uh, sorry. I meant, does the engine automatically detect all the timestamp columns and generate the transforms? Uh, yes. So, so essentially what you're, what you're doing is you're saying this column is transformed. So essentially when it writes the data, so essentially if I know, Hey, I'm being partitioned by this, this transform, when it's writing the data and generating all this metadata, it's transforming the values. Now, let's say it's not going to rewrite it based on previous data. So what's going to happen is that, let's say I've been ingesting, my data has been partitioned by like a, a by year for the last, let's say five years. So all my partition values are in my metadata are year values. So basically this from this year to that year, 2023, 2021, 2022, that kind of thing. But then going forward, I'm ingesting so much data at such a pace that a year is not really going to work for me. And now I need to go to months. So I change and I hit the switch in, my, in the definition of my table saying, going forward, partition the data based on month. So then what's going to happen is that going forward, it's going to write the partition values based on month. But then when it plans the query, so if I say, hey, I want between timestamp between you know, this month in 2022 and that month in 2023, well, the data in 2022 was partitioned by year. So it's going to base it on year. So it's going to say, okay, hey, let me get all the data for 2022 since that's part of the query. But then in 2023, since that's partitioned by month, it can then take advantage and say, hey, well, you specified this month. Let me only get the data for these months. So it's going to do it based on what that part of the data was. But the idea is that you don't have to rewrite the old data. So I'm fine with the older data being partitioned by year and going forward partitioning by month. And then maybe later on, I evolve it today. Um, but basically, again, the way that the user queries, it never changes as the, the partitioning changes. Um, the partitioning evolves, the queries just come in the same. They just keep specifying that timestamp and the queries will be planned based on how the different portions of the data were partitioned at the time that they were written. Hopefully that is a little clear. Um, does Iceberg support CDC updates? I'm pretty sure that is sort of very high on the current um, of, a, of, of basically the things they're working on at the moment. Uh, basically they do hold these um, like bi-weekly uh, public iceberg meetings with uh, the developers. And they do also have like a public document that you can see to see what the discussions of those meetings are. Um, but I'm pretty sure CDC has come up at a few of the last couple of meetings. Uh, what is the current status of that? I don't know off the uh, top of my head, but that is something that is, that is certainly something that is in, uh, I would say in short run support. Uh, so it's not there now, but soon shall be. Uh, for change data support. And again, the, the hows and what's, um, I think some of those proposals are being discussed. Um, and you can see that in those public notes for those for those developer meetings. And again, those are run every few weeks. Uh, they're open to the public, which is another really nice thing about I Iceberg, that the whole development process is very transparent. Um, so you can, you can see those discussions, you can follow those discussions uh, quite visibly um, and then and, and see how that goes. So um, there's that. Okay, and with that, I think we are out of questions and I think I'm just about out of time. Oh, wait, I think there's one more question. Is there a need for a user to configure Zscan clustering for, uh, for a huge data block? Okay, so the currently the way like Z, um, Z order clustering works in Iceberg is that it's part of the rewrite data files procedure. So basically when you do compaction, you can then cluster the data in Z order style. So basically you're, taking a look at like multiple fields and creating like that sort of like where like I can much, I can explain it much better when I have like a diagram and I can draw like the four quadrants and see how the data is kind of clustered together. But basically when you run that rewrite data files procedure, one of the options you have is to sort. And originally you could sort by like a single column so, or, you know, a sequence, sequence of columns. So like sort on data column A first, then sort on column B and then sort on column C and you would cluster the data that way. Uh, a few versions ago, they added Z order support. So now when you run those compaction jobs, you can then specify, say, hey, I want to do a Z order based on these two columns. And then it'll it'll create that sort of Z order clustering. So it would just depend on how you arrange those jobs and how frequently you arrange those jobs. Um, but, you, but those are jobs that right now um, you have to trigger manually. 
uh, among different engines. Um, I, I would be, you, you should be seeing in the future more tools for automating a lot of those uh, maintenance operations. Um, so whether, I mean, I'll, I'll wait, for, I, I, I will wait for those things to, to make themselves apparent, but there will be certainly many options for, for making optimizing iceberg tables uh, much easier and more automated uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, cool, 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 cool. And I think that's it. So I, it's been a wonderful time hanging out with you guys today. Again, next week, we're going to be talking about optimizing your BI dashboards in Tableau with Dremio. So make sure to be there. And again, of course, you can always catch these after, uh, watch the recording on YouTube. So that's at youtube.com slash Dremio. And now we're available on pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. So that could be on Spotify, on iTunes, on iHeartRadio. So go subscribe, uh, share it with your friends. And as usual, thank you guys coming every week. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great evening.